All right, guys, so we are gonna get started. It is just after 10 o'clock now. So first and foremost, welcome to Virtual Otter Day. Thank you so much for joining us for our first otter experience of the day today. We're very excited. Um, joining me here today is Katina Wright. Um, yeah. She is the other picture you guys are gonna see chatting with you here. And she is one of our otter zookeepers and has been working with them for many years now. So we get the pleasure of hearing from her as we watch a really cool otter enrichment video today. Um, just some basics really quick first. If you're not too familiar with Zoom, we do have a couple ways of you being able to interact and communicate with us today. Uh, we have a chat function, so if you want to go into the chat, um, you can communicate with us and just make comments if you'd like to. If you have a question that you want answered by myself or Katina, please utilize the Q&A, which should be at the bottom of your screen. So once you click on that, you can send us a question. And we're gonna do some talking throughout the video, and then at the end, we'll try our best to answer as many questions as we can today. So on that note, I'm gonna get our enrichment video playing. So Katina, we do have two North American river otters at our zoo. Yes, we can do. you tell me a little bit about them? What are their names, where they came from? How old are they? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, we have two otters. We have Sailor, who is 13. He came to us in May 2012. He's our male. Uh, he came to us from Alligator Adventure Park in Myrtle Beach. And the way you can tell him apart from Ash, he's, he's like a more of a chocolate brown color and he's got a mark under his nose that looks kind of like a smile. And then Ashki we got just this past March. She's only been here a couple months. Uh, she's our female. She came from National Zoo. She's four. Uh, she doesn't have a mark under her nose. Uh, she's a little lighter brown, a little smaller than Sailor. Very cool. So we just saw one of our other zookeepers go in and drop in an ice block for enrichment. Uh, when he went out there, there were no otters in there with him. The otters were in their back holding area while he put the enrichment in. And now the otters have been let out to interact with that. So Katina, can you tell me a little bit about what that enrichment is today? It's an ice block, but can you explain it a little bit more? All right. So what we've done is uh, we made an ice block and we put um, their diet, their morning diet, which is fish in the, inside the, the water when we froze it. And we also put um, a chain through it and it's connected to an anchor so it's submerged underwater. So what the otters are doing is uh, they're clawing at it and uh, biting it to get the ice away and so they can get the fish uh, inside the ice block. Um, the otters here get uh, a diet of, um, AM diet of fish so they can get uh, herring, capelins, uh, mackerel, sardines. Uh, I believe there's both capelin and uh, herring in that particular ice block right now. Nice, and we do a lot of different forms of enrichment for the animals at our zoo. What makes the ice block such a good option for them? Well, it's a chance for them to use um, just uh, what they would do normally, like just use their, uh, their claws and their teeth try to bite some. It encourages natural behaviors. Um, it's it's kind of like a puzzle feeder for them. Instead of just like just putting a food out on a dish, it's kind of a little boring. This way they got to work a little harder and it um, it makes it last longer and it gives them like more something to do. And you'll also see like the rocks down there at the bottom. They're just trying to make that natural too. Sometimes we'll throw fish in there and they'll have to like sift through the rocks and get that. Very cool. I like that you mentioned their claws too, because a lot of people see the otters swimming and thinking that they're very cute, forgetting that they are carnivores. They do have very sharp teeth and very sharp claws. Yes. They can certainly do damage even on a solid block of ice. Yes. <laughs> um, what are some other forms of enrichment that they like besides the ice block? Well, we do uh, different things. Uh, of course, their favorite is anything that involves food. Uh, we also do different things. Like you can see that circle that's right at the bottom of the screen. That's actually a mirror. Uh, so we do a lot of sensory, uh, sometimes we'll put different scents in the yard. So it's either visual or something they'll have to work at, like a puzzle. Uh, we'll do like live fish, which they love that. Anything that encourages like a natural behavior, they really like. And they like interacting actually with um, people too. So training is um, another form we do. Well, it's, it's, in a sense, it's enrichment. Uh, they love that, that interaction between people. Very cool. Huh. Um, now our zoo also does behavior training with many of our other animals um, and if you guys as viewers look on our website and our social media you'll be able to see a video of Katina training one of our previous otters. 
Mm -hmm. Now, Katina, these are two different otters than what we see in the video. These are our current two otters that we have. Um, can you explain a little bit about that training process and are there any plans to train Sailor and Ash in the future? Uh, yes. Um, what we do is like you might have seen in the past, like if you've seen one of our otter demos, like I'll do what's called free contact. I'll go right out in the yard and I used to work with um, Heather and Sarah and I'll do uh, the training behaviors out there with them in the yard. Um, Ash and her previous zoo um, and Sailor right now are both um, currently doing what we call protected contact training. So they, we do um, behaviors with them, but we have a barrier between us. So we don't actually go like right out in the yard. We have like a, a mesh barrier. So we do um, training like with just uh, husbandry stuff like coming when called or targeting, standing up, um, going on a scale. So I brought a few things that we use for training here. So you see, this is our target pole. This fits right through the mesh. And then we ask them to, uh, we say the word target and they touch their nose to this little tip right here. And then um, I brought a clicker, which is also something we use to train. It's called the bridge. So after they touch their nose to this, they'll hear like that noise. And then they know what we did, uh, what we asked them to do was correct. And then they get um, a treat, which is just part of their normal diet. So they, they, did, they just um, do behaviors and they just get their normal uh, diet. We don't ask them to do anything they don't wanna do. Um, so they'll get their diet regardless. It's just a fun way of interacting with them. And then it's, it's nice for us too because it works on uh, husbandry and medical behaviors because this way we can, when we ask them to stand, we can see their body. We'll ask them left paw and right paw and then we can see their paws. Coming when called is nice. You know, that helps us bring them in or move them different places. And targeting is nice too because then you can like put a scale under here and ask them to go up on the scale. That's very nice. And now if you are asking um, an otter to do a behavior and they are not into it, do you have to keep on asking over and over again? Do you move on and just go past it? What's the, what's the method with that? Uh, if they're not, like we've had a few times, like in the summer it's harder to engage them because they really don't, they're not, a, too much of a fan of the heat. So they're a little on the, I'd say more lazy side, but uh, so at that point we either just end the session or if they're just not understanding what I'm asking, then I'll, I'll find a way where I can communicate better like on what they were, they're supposed to be doing. So they don't get frustrated. We don't keep asking over and over. There's like a point where even if they don't understand that behavior, I'll go back to a different behavior that they already know. So they don't get frustrated and they'll get rewarded for doing that behavior. That makes sense. I think that would uh, be the same case with me too. If somebody asked me to do the same thing over and over again, I probably wouldn't be any more willing to do it the 10th time as I was the first or second time. So oh, yes. I definitely get that, but I'm sure food is a good motivator for that too. Oh yes, it is. Now, when you start training new otters, um, what behaviors do you try to train first and why? Like what, what, what's your basic, like what do you start with with them? Uh, it's both coming when called, because um, like when we got a new otter and like when we got Ash in, um, it was important like for when we introduce her to the yard, this way we have a way to, to call her back into her holding area. Uh, that and both um, targeting, which is um, very easy to train. And then, like I said, it, lets, it allows us to move them from place to place or get a good weight on them. So I think those two behaviors are the, the first two we try to train. Nice. Yep. Very cool. If you guys have been to the zoo and seen um, probably Katina training with our otters during our normal summer experiences, um, we're looking at a very different time right now. So um, any experiences we see going forward with them are probably going to be similar to this where we're putting enrichment for them um, and really just letting them interact with it themselves. But be assured that Katina is still working on that training with them. We're just taking different methods right now with having a new otter and the circumstances in the world right now are kind of all coming into play, but our keepers are being very creative and flexible and still making sure that they're uh, getting that training in as much as they can. So although the two otters that we have at our zoo are doing great, as you can see, very much enjoying their enrichment, unfortunately we can't say the same for their natural counterparts. So um, North American river otters are found in our Genesee River, historically. This is a really great habitat for them right here in Rochester. And they do stay here all year round too, they have a dual layer coat. So they have like a really thick 
fluffy underlayer that sticks right against their skin and keeps them warm and insulated. And they also have an outer layer that is um, kind of oily and water repellent that keeps that under layer nice and dry. So as you see our otters swimming underwater to interact with that enrichment, you should see some air bubbles coming off of them. And that's showing that that coat is doing a really good job. Um, we talked a little bit about their claws and their teeth and how well adapted they are for survival and for hunting. But unfortunately, they've had a really rocky history, especially in our area, if we're talking about their conservation and their natural survival. Um, for quite a, a few years, they were actually extirpated, which means they were locally extinct from our area. And the main causes of that um, were pollution in our local waterways. We didn't really have any hunting or trapping regulations. And unfortunately, a lot of people do like that otter fur. So they were over trapping and also over fishing. So we talked about how they're carnivores, they like to eat fish. We have to make sure we're leaving an ample amount of food for them as well. So for many, many years, they were not found in this area at all. But the good news is we're doing better now. We're seeing them start to come back. We were part of the New York River Otter Project in the late 90s, which reintroduced almost 300 otters to our area. And you can't do that without, of course, solving the other problems first. We did a lot of cleanup efforts on our local waterways and made it a good habitat for them to live in. And the good news is, is that it did work. So we are starting to see otters rebound in our areas which is excellent. It's really important to have otters to keep our river and waterway ecosystems balanced. But they're not out of the dark yet. It's not like they're, they're back, they're fine, we can all go back to normal life. We have to make sure that we're doing some things to help keep them at these good healthy levels to keep them from declining again. So Katina, do you have some ideas of what our viewers can do to ensure the future survival of otters in our Genesee River? Because there's definitely things we have to do um, being around these local waterways too. Yeah, the uh, most important thing you can do is recycling. It's simple, it's easy. Uh, it's one of the things I used to have Heather and Sarah do because they just shared a really powerful message. Uh, it helps keep uh, the waterways clean. Um, pollution would really harm our otters, not just our otters, but anything that would be living in there and especially like the food source for the otters. So yeah, that's it's one real important thing and it's it's so simple and easy to do. Absolutely yeah and we have you know a lot of places are making it very easy to recycle it too so always just make sure that when you're throwing something away stop for a minute think about can I recycle it is there a way for me to reuse it that helps too if you can upcycle it's really great um, and also just re reducing the use of any of our single-use plastics too it's very easy to get a reusable water bottle reusable shopping bags so we're not, you know, creating all of that mess that may end up in our waterways. Uh, people also don't think about the fact that when you litter, a lot of times that litter will end up in the waterways. Because although you could be very far away from the river, if you throw a piece of garbage on the ground, we'll have wind and rain eventually come through and a lot of that stuff does end up in the waterways and can be very harmful for our otters as well. So again, just very easy things we can do to help. Um, so we are going to take a few questions here. I see lots of people have been participating in our Q&A. So we're going to put Katina on the spot here. Um, we have Monica asking, how are Sailor and Ashkey getting along? And are you seeing any breeding behavior? Well, we actually got really lucky. Um, when they first got introduced, um, they got uh, along so nicely. Like, at first we started slowly. Like, we gave them, like, contact just through mesh so they could just see each other and uh, Sailor was really interested in Ash and you just wanted to just watch her and she was a little more vocal and was making noise and then uh, kind of whining at him and just um, but you know she got used to him being there and then after I think it was about two maybe a little more two weeks than that then uh, they went out on exhibit together and they did fine and now they're always together uh, they get along great. We've seen a little bit of breeding on and off. Um, so I'm hoping all goes well for, for next year. We missed the breeding season for this year. So we're hoping for in the future. <laughs> That's very, very good sign so far. And we also do have a breeding recommendation for them through our species survival plan, um, mm -hmm. which you may see on our signage if you've been through our zoo. There's a little logo that says SSP. So that does stand for Species Survival Plan, which is basically like a really big database of the genetics of different animals in the zoo. So we make sure that uh, we don't inbreed any otters. They have different genetics that will make them a nice strong offspring. 
Um, it also kind of recommends different matches. So Ashkey did come here to be with Sailor on that SSP breeding recommendation. So we are definitely hopeful for the breeding behaviors and it sounds like we're seeing good signs so far. So stay tuned in the upcoming years to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is from Mark and Mark wants to know, Katina, do you have a favorite otter? I do. Um, unfortunately, he passed. Uh, the first otter I trained was Admiral. Um, I started training the otters back, I think it was 2007. And um, he was the one that was, uh, let's see, it was him and uh, there was a couple other otters. But Admiral was just like, he really loved training and I worked with him for many years and he was the first otter I actually, um, I trained and got the whole otter program, training program started on. And so it was my first time training and it was his first time really learning behaviors and with just, we just worked off each other real well. And he was just wonderful to work with and a pleasure to see every day and work with and like some of the behaviors, he made it so easy. I was trying to get, I was trying to figure out how to do the holding position where I have him lay on their back. And I go, Admiral, can you lay on your back? And then he just did it. And I just captured the behavior after that. And not so much with the girls. I had to really work hard to get them to go on their backs. But no, I love him so much. I still love him. And uh, he still has a brick right outside. Um, it says his name on it. It's in the, the circle outside the eco center. That's really nice. So if anybody's ever talked to any of our zookeepers, they all have pretty similar stories with Katina. They always have those animals that they really like got their passion going for them and they really connect with. So it's when you come into the zoo, you're not just seeing our animals in their habitats doing their thing. They also have this really strong connection with their zookeepers. They're building through things like training and enrichment too. So not only are they well cared for, they're very well loved too at our zoo. Yes. So I always love hearing you guys talk about your love for the animals that you've worked with. Oh, yes, yes, I love we have a We have a question coming in from Jennifer that is asking, what else do you train them? So what are some of the other behaviors that you would do with them? Oh, that's a nice question. Yeah, so what I train with, um, like when I talked about target training, coming on call, those are husbandry behaviors. So I, I've, I've taught the otters um, husbandry behaviors such as that, um, going on a scale, targeting. Um, I also use the target pole for like left paw and right paw so they can put the different paws on here. Um, I get them to stand up. Uh, let's see, I, um, just for a fun behavior, I taught them how to wave, which I also use this for. I had them trying to stretch their paw out to reach it. So I just captured that behavior. And then I also got natural behaviors that I taught them as well. So I get them to um, uh, go into the water when asked and then they'll do like a barrel roll and they also swim on their back. And then uh, they, I taught them how to do the high dive, which uh, I get them to go across that little, um, like kind of see it in the corner of the screen. They go across that piece of wood. They get up on top of the, um, the rock work and, and go into, they do a dive into the water. And then um, recycling, which I already explained is, it's, it's um, what I tell them to do is grasp. That's the, that's the word for what they're doing. And I'll hand them like a bottle and then tell them to grasp. And that's a natural behavior too, just like picking up an object and grasping it in their paws. And then, then I have them drop it into the, the recycle bin. And then another behavior I like that I, I taught them that was really useful was, um, I brought one of these here. This is Sarah's shape, the yellow square. Uh, Heather had a red circle and Sailor's got a blue uh, triangle. And uh, so each otter has their own shape with color and they can each target to their own colors. They know the difference between them. So I had, um, like I can, we can put like the red and the yellow out for Sarah and she knows only to go to her yellow square and Heather knew only to go to her red circle. And then same with Sailor, he'll go to the, I don't work with him out on exhibit, but in the holding area, we'll put up the different shapes and he'll just go to his blue triangle. And we're actually working on um, a study with RIT that involves those, uh, those same shapes and uh, how well they know their shape and color. Excellent, so it sounds like it's very complex. It is. Yeah. Not going with them, very cool. And we have George asking um, if their teeth are sensitive to the ice block when they try to chew through it. Um, I don't really 
really because they get um we actually had, had when we had heather she actually loved eating ice so in the summer i would just give them a bucket of ice and i'd throw treats in it for enrichment and she would eat the treats and eat the ice too so she loved nice. the ice um all the otters do like they, they can easily break through that sometimes i'll give them like fish that's a little more on the frozen side and they'll, they'll eat that up right away they have very powerful teeth so. Absolutely. A good way to cool down in the hot weather, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, another question from George. He's asking, what do otters do in the winter? So are they any different in the wintertime at our zoo as they are in the summer? Um, yeah, they're more active. Um, <laughs> they love the winter uh, and the colder months, early spring. Um, it's fun. You can watch them playing in the snow. Admiral is another one. I used to love working with him because he used to he would like find like a big snow mound and dive into it and then he would do like like he would lift his back end up his head down and just kind of make this little trail through the snow pushing his head through it or i'd make a snow mound for him and he would jump into it so they are really playful they love the the winter and it's fun watching them in the snow so. nice and then the uh the, their nice, well-adapted coat, I'm sure, makes it so they don't mind the cold at all. It doesn't really get to them. Yeah, no, they get they get a lot bushier. Uh, you know, they put on their winter coat, and um, like in their holding, yeah, we we add um, in their dens. We give them extra bedding, like like either more wood wool or straw, and uh, they get blankets too that they they snuggle up. And so they do they do have a warm, dry spot to go when they're not out on exhibit. Perfect. Um, we have Brandy asking, how and when do you clean their water and their habitats? Oh, um, well, their yard gets in their holding, gets cleaned every day. Uh, the pool gets drained. Let's see, not so much now, like maybe, hmm, maybe a couple times a month, like we'll do a full drain because uh, the algae gets up on the window. We got to clean that up and just clean the rocks. But definitely in the fall, it gets... Well, you, you need to do it a lot more there because with the leaf litter and everything from the trees falling in, uh, it gets cleaned, they'll say, probably every other week. It's full drained and cleaned. Nice. We have um, Harry asking, um, how much do they eat per day? Well, they get um, eight ounces of fish uh, in the morning, and then they get... Um, a cup of uh, dog chow along with 12 ounces of uh, ground meat in the afternoon. And then we also give like the occasional treat, like they love hard boiled egg. Uh, they'll actually eat like chunks of carrot or yam or squash. And um, we'll give them uh, sometimes like a different piece of meat. Like if we have like chicken or oh, they like venison or um, shank meat they like. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. And we have Anonymous asks, how do they open their eyes underwater? Because most people have to use goggles. So I can assure you our otters don't have to wear goggles, but Katina, can you tell us a little bit more about how they can maybe find their prey underwater? Yes, um, they're well adapted. They actually have like a kind of like a clear lid that goes over their eye so they can see. And then they'll use their whiskers to sense vibration in the water. And uh, they can actually close off their ears and their nose while they're under. And they can stay under for about four minutes at a time and they'll use their tail kind of as a rudder so they can they can actually turn really fast um i think we have a live fish enrichment coming up at one and then you can actually see them like find the fish real easily and then just like do this real quick turn and they'll go go right after what they want nice mm -hmm. definitely definitely well adapted animals i i love their adaptations they always amaze me when i think about it yeah, yeah. We have Brandy asking, does the public get to interact with the otters? So it kind of makes me think about one of our sea lions that's very interactive with guests at the glass. Are yeah. otters like that at all? Or are there other ways that the, the guests can really come in and interact with them? Yes, actually we got, um, Sarah used to do it. Um, then Ash is actually doing it right now too. Um, the same as Mary Lou, like you can go pretty much right up to the glass and then just show her like an object or just stand there and just like make like hand gestures and she'll come right to you pretty much. Um, but she's also, I've never seen her interact with the public before. Like she knows myself and Brian enough to do that, but I'm sure like if you just go up and, uh, cause she loves people so much, she might probably still do that too. And what I found like, cause I was trying to find a way to get people to interact. So that's why I had like my training demo, like the shape that we have here, like 
we'd have the interpreter at a certain part get a guest from um, the audience come up and then they, they could hold the, the shape up and the otter would swim to them. So that was, that was one of the reasons I, I had, I trained that behavior is just so I could get that interaction more like with the public interacting with the otter. Very cool. So we'll definitely see how that develops over the coming months and years too. Very, very exciting to have new animals in and, and see where we get to take everything that they're able to do too. Mm -hmm. have, asking if you see them while they're in quarantine or maybe how they have um, changed their behavior during quarantine. Has it really been affecting them to have the zoo closed or do you not notice too much that's different? Um, well, it's hard to tell with Ash because we, like, literally, we just got her from National Zoo, like, the Wednesday before all this happened. So I've never seen her interact, like, with the public here. But as I said, she's, she's just, like, loving the time out on exhibit with Sailor. They're always out. They're, like, when they see somebody by the glass, uh, Ash will just go up and interact with you. Sailor just, I haven't noticed anything with him. He's just, he's just Sailor, like. He's just interested in Ash now and just follows her around. So I haven't noticed too much of a difference. Um, I do have to change the way I train with them. So we're supposed to have like a six feet distance from when we work with them. So I'm trying to adapt a, a different training program on, on how to work with that. And it's sort of working right now. So it's just the more you get used to it and then the more creative I can get, then, um, then hopefully I'll have a, a nice training program going. Absolutely. It's definitely a, all about adjusting and adapting for both the animals and especially the people during this time too. Yeah. But we're doing everything we possibly can to make sure our animals are safe. We're going above and beyond to keep the extra distance to make sure everybody stays healthy too. Yeah. And we are just about at our half hour mark. So we have one more question for you, Katina. Okay. We have it from five-year-old Amelia. And she says that she saw the penguins out playing with bubbles one time. So she wants to know if there's any other toys or enrichment activities that the otters like to play with that might be similar. I guess actually we've, we've done bubbles before with them. Uh, we put it, uh, it was a windy day. So um, our other keeper, Brian, put it inside and Ash saw the bubbles through the glass and she was interacting with them there. Um, but yeah, they, they love that kind of thing. Um, hammocks, another good enrichment for them. They love their afternoon naps and then they get, um, they go in their hammocks. Uh, let's see, I think, I don't think there's any other like quirky enrichment we do, like other, like with the bubbles. Uh, like we do have the bubble machine that we use with them too. Nice. But yeah, that nice. definitely, anything with food, the hammocks or the wraps that, that we have on the, in the water. They, those kind of things they love. Anything with food. Yep. I get that. <laughs> and if you guys, um, when we do reopen, if you see your favorite enrichment, something like bubbles with the penguins, keep your eyes out because a lot of times we are able to use similar enrichment or the same enrichment for other animals too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always fun to kind of take a minute, look through the habitats that the animals are living in, try to find new enrichment for that day and maybe make those connections like we using the same type of thing for penguins and otters. I really love that you made that connection, Amelia. That's very cool. Yeah. So we are just about at 10.30. We are out of time for today. But thank you guys so much for coming to our first virtual otter experience. We do have other events throughout the day today. Um, our next video chat will be our Wednesday Wildlife Wondering at 12.15. And then we do have another otter experience similar to this one with our other zookeeper, Brian, at 1 o'clock. So feel free to go on to our website or social media and get involved with the other Otter Day experiences today. So Katina, thank you so much for joining us and answering all of our questions. We very much appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. And you guys enjoy the rest of your afternoon.